Today on this old house, these six by six columns get trimmed for a finished look. There's a forest in Pennsylvania where all the hardwood flooring for our house comes from, and all of it was harvested sustainably. And I'm gonna try a new way to install stair treads. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice, nice. Here is right on. Money's in the detail. Oh, that is beautiful. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Newton where you can see we are making a lot of progress. The board and plaster guys have swept through the house and most of that is done. The hardwood floors are going down and right here in this space the number one job was to open up these three rooms. Kitchen, living room, dining room, all into one Tommy and to do that, that meant a bunch of beams. It sure did. A bunch of beams that if you look up top they're plastered right now. Right. And to support those beams we have these six by six fur. Now those beams are actually engineered lumber, they're mm -hmm. called LVLs. And there's a beam here, a beam there, and another one there. Those beams are actually carrying the second floor outside wall and the roof, and this beam is carrying the interior floor level all the way up to the ceiling. And so what's driving the decision behind the posts here? Because you've spanned bigger distances than this. Well, absolutely, but the idea of it is the shorter the span, the shorter the beam. Oh, so you want to tuck that up and hide it. Right, so we want to accent it, make it look a plaster beam. Right. So we got to dress up these six by sixes. These six by sixes are fur, and they're not meant to be seen. Gotcha. So we're right. going to cover them up. So you and Maddie are going to hide those and dress them all up nicely? Right, we're going to use this material right here. This is, this is basically uh, figured as like wood flour put together with resins, and it really holds up well. It doesn't expand and contract like regular wood. The mitres go together really nice, nice, and it paints beautifully. All right, we'll see if you can keep up with Maddie, and I'll leave you guys to <laughs> it. All right, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. All right, so we'll get that going. All right, it's looking good. Now, this is going to get painted up top here. This top is going to get stained as an accent piece, and the cabinet below will get painted. I think it looks pretty good. It looks nice and neat, Tom. Great job. Not bad for your first job, Matty. Exactly. <laughs> Since day one of this project, we knew that Liz wanted to make a stained glass window for her mudroom. And this is the studio of her stained glass instructor, Michelle Louillier. Hey, guys. Michelle, Hi, Kevin. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. So hey, Liz, good to see you again. You? Love this cute little studio you've got here. This is terrific. <laughs> Thank you. So you are well underway with this beautiful piece of work of art here. Mm -hmm. Where does this process start? Well, it started with a, a sketch, a small sketch. But this is not a sketch. This is a this is a full size rendering right here. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. I started with a hand sketch, yep. put it in the computer, traced over it so I could enlarge it to the window size. Gotcha. Okay. And how do you end up with the colors? First, just sticking with one sheet of glass would be kind of boring, especially when you want to talk about uh, leaves and the way they catch the light. Mm -hmm. And uh, so once we refine this, then I was able to look in my uh, studio and find the sheets of glass that she wanted to, to use. So for example, we use this uh, French glass here, which is a flash glass, we just Try to find a glass that's got a lot of character and a lot of movement. So a, a, a simple design, a full-scale design, mm -hmm. a lot of work on what the glass is. Yes, yeah. we did. And go then back. you get to work. Yep. Yeah. Then I went to Michelle's class and we took this drawing, made copies of it, and made a template that you cut the glass around. So, so this tells you. Oh wow. How you've got to actually this is like a piece of thick paper here. You've got to cut out every single piece in paper. Yes, everything in paper and then that tells you how big the glass needs to be. And then you want to make sure that the glass is exactly the size of the paper, otherwise mm -hmm. it will not fit in the space. Right. And you can't have an expanding window. <laughs> so, um, I actually have one more piece left, but we grind it and then mm. put this 
copper foil on. I'd love to see some of that. Can you yeah. grind it for us? Yeah, I've got one more piece to go. So this is a grinder here. Um, it's got a wheel and a grinding blade, and then um, it also uses water to keep the dust down. Nice. So now we clean it with some alcohol, and then we can apply the copper foil. And the foil um, that you talk about, what is that for? That is to hold the solder to the piece of glass. So mm -hmm. that's what keeps it all together. So you want to put the glass on as centered as you can. Then you do the sides. Oh, yeah. And you can actually see it just sort of tightening up there. Mm-hmm. Let's see if it fits. Like a glove. Here we go. So on to soldering? On to soldering. All right. All right, so I'm going to start at the top of the line. Mm. And what I want to do is feed the solder through the back of the soldering iron. And so the solder, we know, is sticking to the copper, and the copper is adhered to the glass. Yes. So that's connecting everything? Yes. Brilliant. The solder doesn't attach to the glass. Oh, yeah, the getting it flat that definitely helps. So once you have actually soldered this entire side, Michelle, does the other side have to be soldered as, as well? Yes, we need to flip the panel and then do the same process on the other side. Wow, painstaking. So, so you guys actually have a lot more to do here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I'll leave you to that. But I can't wait to see this in the house. It's going to be exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. All right, thank you, Liz. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. Watch it all in the This Old House app. And join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Homeowners want oak floors here in the kitchen and in the in-law suite above the garage. And there are a lot of suppliers for hardwood floors, but they're not all created equal. And our homeowners, well, they actually chose a supplier that takes special care when they harvest their trees. So the other day, I went to the hills of western Pennsylvania to check out the operation. I'm about an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh on a large forestry operation owned by the Hickman family. The Hickmans have been cutting trees from this land for four generations to feed their sawmills. But it's the way that they cut the trees that has brought me here. The Hickmans will only cut trees in a sustainable fashion. Jessica, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Kevin. Thanks, thanks for having me out Yeah, here. thanks for coming out. So tell me about um, this sustainability and your guys' certification. What does that mean for your operation? Yeah, it's really important for us to be sustainable. Um, we're FSC certified. So that's Forest? Forest Stewardship Council. Okay. Basically, we want to make sure we're growing more than we're harvesting. Oh, really? Right. So, yeah. So there's more growth coming out of this forest than what you're taking out. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, cool. absolutely. I mean, we recently cut here, and you can look out, and there's still a lot of trees. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know? Yeah, no, this does not look like a logging operation at yeah. all. What else does it mean to be certified? We'll leave standing timber mm -hmm. um, that's dead, like for a den. You know, if there's critters that are living in it, we'll leave that dead tree right. for the animal. So that's, that's part of it as well. Yeah. Um, also, you know, then what goes to the marketplace? You know, that's, that's a big thing with the FSC is so that you as a consumer know that you're purchasing products from a sustainable, well-managed yes. forest. So you're required to have some sort of a chain of control. Absolutely. So that I know There's when a lot I buy it of paperwork there. with it. Gotcha. Absolutely. So back in the 1940s, my great-grandfather actually clear-cut this property during the war, you know. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather here, this is Pop Larry. Pop Larry, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, sir. Pleasure. Thanks, Kevin. So, so clear-cut at one point um, by your dad, uh -huh. and then it looks like you changed up the routine. Well, yeah, it regenerated very nicely, and uh, not only that, but it maintains a continuous supply of product mm. throughout the year. And uh, what we do by doing that is maintain a certain uh, cubic feet per acre, which yep. creates the maximum growth. So what is coming down today? Is this one of the ones well, that Well, we selected this tree right here because it's a mature red oak, so by taking this out, it'll let the sunlight in and it'll release seedlings and they'll, they'll start to grow. It's a continuous process. Yeah. Clear from the acorn up. Okay. So now that you see it down, what do you think of that piece of lumber? Well, I think it's beautiful. I, about 700, 
square feet of uh, flooring could be made out of that log. Really? Can you guess how old that is? It's probably uh, 80 years old. So that came up from the original clear cut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a large enough log to quarter saw, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that log will quarter saw. Along with this harvest, Jessica and I made our way to the sawmill run by her brother Jake. It goes from here straight to the debarker. To prep the log and to protect the downstream mill blades, the debarker makes short work of the coarse exterior, which in turn is sold off to landscapers as mulch. From here, the logs progress inside to the mill and are turned into cans by the head saw. A can is a log that's been squared on all four sides. It makes it easier for the resaws to cut it. Big operation. Yeah. All right, so this is the big resaw. This is where the cant comes after the head saw. So the guy marking the board is giving instructions to the guy in the box to tell him how to cut it. Because each one of these cants that we have up here, some of them are going to be plain sawn and some are going to be quarter sawn. And, you know, so every one is different. And that guy marking it is giving the direction. So now he's just cutting one board at a time? One board at a time. Comes back around and cuts one board again. The boards come down and some of them have weighing on them, which is bark or lack of wood. They go through the saw and clean up the sides. And so what's going on down here? So down here, these guys are basically doing what the marks tell them to do. Uh, they're separating the lengths and from down here, it's ready to be dried. Man, this is a lot of wood. <laughs> yeah, uh, so this is where it comes to get dried. It may not be the most exciting part about what happens at the sawmill, but it may be one of the most important parts. Right. And it might sit on the air drying yard for up to a year. Wow. So, I mean, how wet is the wood when it's green? Like, what percentage moisture? It could be 80% um, moisture content, and then we need to get it dried down to 6% for our flooring. That's what we dry it to. So, air dry and then eventually into a kiln? Right. The kiln is right behind this stack of lumber. Yeah. How long can our flooring be in the kiln? A little about a month. <laughs> yeah, the quarter saw and flooring that you guys have that can take, you know, take up to two months if it was green going in. So a lot of drying goes on with this wood. Yep. And once it's dry, we're off to where? We're off to the flooring plants. Now dried, our rough sawn lumber begins to be dressed out to flooring. It gets scanned, sorted, planed, and trued before heading off to a finer milling. Jessica and I meet up with her dad, who'll take us through the milling process. So what we have here is what we saw in the lower building. Rift and quartered white oak, surfaced to 15 16 ripped to four and a half inches wide. Okay. Ready to come into the molder. Okay, this molder is a six head machine, six different heads in here. Jack is picking which face, comes through upside down. First head is just a hogging head, takes a little bit of wood off. Off the face side. Off the face side, yep. yes. Second head, puts the groove. Third head, puts the tongue. Fourth head is just a hogging head, taking some off of this, the bottom side. The fifth head puts the relief cut on it. Yep. And then the last head is just a finished head on the face. So what's happening here is Tim is chopping out unsound defects, okay? We've got a clear grade, we've got a natural grade. Sound knots will be allowed in. What we're chopping out is anything that you wouldn't want in your floor. A check, a split, maybe a hole in the wood. Exactly. Okay. So after the chop saw, the flooring comes out here. These guys are doing the grade separations. That is some good looking stuff yeah, right there. Pretty nice stuff. Okay, Kevin, so this is our last step. Air grabs the board. We have a saw cuts it square. There's two horizontal saws to put a tongue on this side. The rollers take it to the other side. Same thing happens. The groove is put on the opposite side. From there it goes over, is made into nested bundles, packaged, ready to put on a truck. Next stop, our house, huh? Next stop, your house, right. Denny, thank you very much. Thank you to the whole family. We love knowing where our hardwood floors came from. Cool.
Now you can watch this old house and ask this old house anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovation, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. Best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. Part of our Generation Next initiative, we're trying to convince young people to consider the building trades as a career path. It was 100 years ago the federal government first started funding vocational education. But today's vocational schools are nothing like they were when I grew up. This is Essex Agricultural and Technical High School, and the variety of the curriculum that's being taught inside this building is amazing. In addition to traditional high school coursework, English, math, and science, they also have classes in equine science culinary arts, graphic communications, automotive technology. This lab teaches the skills needed to start a career as an electrician. But we came here for the plumbing and HVAC shops. As you may know, two of the students from here are actually working with us on the Newton This House project. And Jim Russell is our plumbing instructor here. Hey, Jim. Hey, Rich. How you doing? Nice to be here in your laboratory. Thank you very much for coming. Take us through what's going on here. So basically, uh, we're trying to mimic the outside world in this shop atmosphere. And we can do all that with uh, these booths that are here. Right. Uh, Every, me, everything they might find everything out the they world. Everything they might find. Let me show you. All right. Cedric here is installing a shower valve. All right. So Cedric, what do you got? Oh, you got, here's what you're trying to match there? Yeah, I'm trying to match this once a year. So you've drilled the studs and, and anchored everything? Yeah. Good. Nicely done. It won't make any noise in the wall, too, will it? Nope. Good job. Let me take you over here. Uh, these two students are installing a toilet. Hey guys. Hey, how's it going? You guys do the drain work here too? Yes, we did. What do you use? Uh, PVC. In the old days, we used to pour hot lead. It's a lot easier with PVC. I bet. We also have them use that cast iron as well as the PVC because they need to know how to use all Try the fittings all and that. transitions yeah. and so right. forth. And it's not just plumbing either. We also teach heating, basic hydronics, right. uh, high efficiency boiler. So heating boiler right here, all the proper piping. Yep. These girls are hooking in a heat zone as we speak. Got the smart people doing the heating. <laughs> I'm getting cold. So guys, let, I hate to stop you from all your work, but I want to take a couple of minutes just to say thank you. Let, thanks for letting us come visit you guys today. Jim's not listening. Are you learning enough here to get, go out into the trade? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's great. How did it happen? How did you choose to come? Came here for carpentry, didn't know what I wanted to do. Came into the plumbing shop, found Mr. Russell, it was really nice, and yeah. I just enjoy working around here. But I still think it's magic when you do a plumbing system and you got hot and cold water where it should be, it's clean water you can trust, the waste goes away, right? Everybody's so happy. It's like magic, isn't it? And when you first have a heating system, you flip on the switch and people think you're a genius. <laughs> I wish you guys the best. I really, I'm really excited for it. This is not your father's Votech school. They're teaching real life skills in the trades. And for many of these kids, they're also helping to build them a career. The oak floor in Millforce in Pennsylvania is down in the family room and throughout the kitchen. But in the mud room, well, we're actually putting down a cement tile. We saw our homeowner design this on a computer. It's a great room for it because there's a lot of traffic. You can come in from the outside, from the porch right here. You can come in from the garage up into this space. And also, Joe's parents uh, have got some room above the garage, and you'll be getting to that up this beautiful staircase you're putting in, Norm. That's right. This is all, you know, wood. It's got skirt boards made out of poplar, risers made out of poplar, and then some nice white oak treads mm -hmm. and a big heavy newel post right here. Poplar going to get painted, yep. oak going to stay stained? They'll be stained or clear finish. Nice, okay. So there's two more treads to go in and they're not between the two skirt boards. These, as you see with this one, they're going to extend by because of the newel post. So what I want to do is first I want to cut this to length because if you see I push it up against the skirt board. One, the skirt board may not be perfectly square. So we have a little extra wood. So I take this block, put it between here. Make sure this back edge stays just flush. It's going to go into a groove after we cut it. I take the same block over to the other end. And if I put it up against the skirt board, 
I can use my utility knife just to score the top of the tread, and that's exactly where I want to cut it. Very accurate, even better than using a pair of scribes. All right, see so how we did. Get it into the groove. Take the mallet. That's nice and tight. Ooh, that sure is. All right. So it fits well. Now, in terms of fastening, Norm, because, I mean, I can tell that you didn't want to see any of the fasteners on these right. treads. Right. What's the process? Well, Maddie, who's working here doing a lot of finished carpentry, showed me a new way to put these treads in. You know, we're learning from our own craftspeople, which is great. Even you. And so what he showed me is you use blocks like this, and you actually attach them to the bottom of the tread, with this edge being right behind where this riser is. And then once it's all glued and you set the tread in, you can drive screws through just under the tread, and they go into this block, and they hold the tread in place. And those screws will be covered by the Scotia molding later. Cool. Okay. All right, so the first thing I have to do now is I have to take a pencil and draw a line at the front of the riser so I know where that is. All right, so now here are the blocks. We've actually drawn a line that's three quarters of an inch back just using the block itself. And what we want to do now is we want to put a little bit of glue on these. That three quarter represents the, the thickness of the riser? That's right. So that now we're inbound to that. Cool. And so we'll put this, okay, and I want to be between these two marks. I'll just line it up with that and use a couple brads to secure it first. All right, so it doesn't move. We'll do that first, and then we'll finalize it with some screws. So now we want to put some glue in this groove. Okay, and I want to put some on the top of this end trim board. Okay, now on the stringers, we're actually going to use silicone. Why not? Go well, that's another tip from Maddie. It's a good one. So we'll put a nice bead down. And once the tread is set in there, the silicone, the advantage of the silicone over anything like construction adhesive, which is often used, is that it's flexible and it'll stay stuck to the stringer as well as the bottom of the tread. So if there's any movement, it kind of softens the stair, yet it holds it all together. Mm, the no squeak solution. That's right. So now we gotta get it back in there, get started. Make sure it's down there. Then we gotta get those blocks to just All right, now we're going to put some clamps on it. Before we put the screws in, we'll put one in each of these openings. There we go. All right, that is. does it. Well, look at that, huh? Boy, that is seamless and tight everywhere. Right. Came out well. That's going to be great. Nice job. So uh, what do you got coming up next week? Well, Joe is going to help me repurpose an old door. Nice. And what do you see what Roger's got in store for us? A prefabricated stone wall. Prefabricated? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Norm Abram. For this old house. Prefab. Next time on This Old House. All right, let's put the door in the opening. Let's see how it looks. Make sure it's up against the side of the jam, nice and tight. I got some help rehanging an old door. You've heard of mobile homes? How about mobile stone walls? These are each about 6,000 pounds. That's next time on This Old House. Thanks for watching. This Old House has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.